I will start my presentation where I'm going to talk about perseverance into the unknown and why failing in scientific research is inevitable uh, and something that we should look forward to and that's what scientific research is all about. And I'm going to use a video game called Dark Souls to tell us about, um, give us an example of how failing uh, is part is integral to uh, uh, something. Um, so I am Jason Bennett. I am currently a PhD student at Stony Brook. I just got back from the Netherlands and I graduated from our science college. If you have questions about any of that, please don't hesitate to reach out, shoot me an email and I can talk about it. So let's start off with some video games. Uh, a standard feature of a fantasy role-playing video game where a role-playing video game is something like Knights and Dragons or Ninjas and, and uh, Ninja Stars or something like that. Um, the elements of a game like this are the quest. The quest is something where you talk to another character in the game and they tell you about some problem they're having or something and they tell you okay, you need to go help me with this. And you are given a the quest and you are able to track the objectives of the quest in something like a journal. So in this game called Skyrim Elder Scrolls, we are looking at our journal where the objectives of a quest, the things that we need to accomplish in order for the quest to be complete are listed. Also, you can see that the player has the option to show on a map where we can click on the map and see our current location. We can see where we need to go. And it, it kind of shows us a roadmap to success. Now, a game that is very different from this is Dark Souls, where there are no quests, there are no maps. You simply wander around into an unknown uh, game area. You try to uh, avoid monsters, traps, and all, all sorts of things that can uh, take your character out of the game in seconds. Uh, in fact, the advertisement for the game when it first started was uh, prepare to die now. Uh, it is a very difficult game uh, to give you an idea. Um, the average number of times a player will die in the game is 600. And that's for someone who finishes the game. Um, so some examples, maybe you are running through a castle trying to figure out the right way to go because of course there are no maps and you open a door thinking maybe there's a monster behind it or some treasure or oh look at that wrong uh, thinking there's some treasure or something like that um, but maybe there's just um, uh, you know nothing and uh, you fall off a, a ledge or something um, right or maybe that treasure you were looking for behind the door um, you find some twinkling titanite, which uh, enhances your armor. And so naturally you see another chest and go to open it. But, um, you know, in Dark Souls, maybe it's a, a monster that will eat you. Or you're uh, running through the castle and suddenly a boulder just comes down where you can't avoid it. Um, and of course, all the enemies in the game can um, defeat your character in one hit. So be careful. Don't, don't get hit by any of the enemies. Um, and what's more, it seems like every time you die in the game, you lose your progress, which makes it seem incredibly um, defeating when you, when you are defeated in the game. And so we can see here at the very end of the clip where the character dies and they're sent back to the original starting point in the game, they lose these uh, souls, they're called, the currency in the game. And so it seems like every time you die, you're losing on all the progress that you've made. Um, but that's not really true, right? If you, in a game, you have a second chance. So here we're, we're seeing a clip of the character acting like a, a master of the game, running through, uh, dodging, dodging all the enemies that had originally given them problems because they remember as, a, as an inherent feature of not having a map in a video game, you recall everything. And especially in a game where something around the corner could kill you in, in one uh, swipe or something. Um, it's very easy to recall where you were. And so you learned from that failure that you were doing. Um, you previously uh, were uh, defeated quite quickly and you thought you lost all your points, but you're, you're coming back. And that's indeed uh, the philosophy of the game where this is a quote from the director Miyazaki. He created the game and he says, 
but the main concept behind the death system is trial and error. The difficulty is high, but it's always achievable. Anyone can achieve without all that much technique. All you need to do is learn from your deaths how to overcome the difficulties. Overcoming challenges by learning something in the game is very rewarding, and that's what I wanted to prioritize in Dark Souls and Demon Souls. And because of the online, we'll get more to this later, that's why I put it in italics, you can even learn something from someone else's deaths. I'd say that was the main concept behind the online too. And so this game kind of, I'll talk more about how it relates to research in a bit, but it, it kind of um, gives you the sense of accomplishing things in the, in the face of mountainous advers ad um, adversaries, right? You, you look towards this huge goal, beating the game, which seems um, incredibly difficult. Uh, and if you even bring that over into research, as we'll do, or life, if you look into a goal that looks um, a million miles away and you don't have a set of steps like the journal in, in, your, in your game, which lists all your objectives, it can be very disheartening to uh, accomplish that. But if you break up your task into small things like not dying around this corner or, or recovering your, the souls that you lost when you, when you died, things become, which were initially quite um, disheartening or bleak, um, you can revel in the, in the small victories you have. And so one, one way that this relates to research is what inspired this talk, which is the importance of stupidity in scientific research. This is a paper from 2008 by Professor Schwartz at the University of Virginia. The idea for this essay came when the author was, uh, he met with a friend who he had gone to graduate school with and the friend had uh, dropped out of graduate school, but she went on to law school and she became a super successful lawyer, right? Just another path in life that she became incredibly successful at. And their conversation eventually got back to grad school and why she didn't like it. Um, and she said that she dropped out because she hated the feeling that in scientific research, she was constantly stupid. Um, and the author, upon um, hearing this, goes on in the essay to explain why we feel stupid in scientific research, but moreover, why we should seek it out and why it's an inherent part of scientific research and we shouldn't be ashamed of feeling stupid. One way that I feel is um, very, makes it very easy to visualize why we suddenly feel stupid in scientific research is to use maps. So for instance, in this map here, we have a end goal. The star is where we would like to get. Um, there are various entry points, but at the end of the day, um, be this uh, a homework question that's asking uh, something, uh, a test where there's a question and a well-defined answer, there is, at the end of the day, a goal which you can accomplish. There's something uh, that if you get the right answer, you get 100 on the test and you feel um, like you're good at science, right? If you uh, approach your homework and for all of high school and college, you get uh, good grades, you feel smart, and, and that's that makes sense, right? So even if there are different entry points, for instance, you could be um, a math major, or an art major, or a history major, or a computer science major. If the star is getting the right answer on a physics test, all of those people may have different approaches that lead them to tackle the question in a different way, but at the end of the day, there is still a right answer. And so it leads people to say, okay, I, I got the right answer. I am good at physics. I feel good. I feel not stupid. Um, and this is in contrast to research where research is more of an infinite maze. Um, there is no blue star in the center. There's no predetermined correct answer that you can get. There are dead ends. There are um, ways that you can get through the maze to find something interesting. There are little treasures littered throughout uh, the, the, the infinite maze. And so this drawing back to Dark Souls is kind of uh, a dead end, could be quite literally a dead end, or it could be um, something that you spent a lot of time on and necessarily doesn't um, yield anything fruitful. 
Um, but there are also uh, treasures and um, important um, things that you can do littered throughout the maze. And so in research, there are very uh, distinct approaches that people can take. For instance, all of these blue arrows could be different subfields of physics, um, a condensed matter experiment, a condensed matter theorist, a high energy theorist, a high energy experimentalist, and the list goes on. And there is, for instance, let's say this section of the infinite maze is um, a theory of quantum gravity. There are various ways that you can try to go about this. Um, you can find, let's say the red sun, um, represents uh, an idea that you have that says, okay, this is a dead end, but uh, doing so made me realize something else. Um, and so this is just a way to think about why one might feel stupid when they, when they get into research, because it, it differs from homework and tests in the sense that there is no uh, end, right? There's no, there's no day where uh, researchers get together and say, oh, okay, we're, we're done with science. Um, let's all go home and play Dark Souls. We, we figured everything out. There's, there's no more. We got the blue star in, in this infinite maze because there is no blue star. There's a bunch of yellow stars, which are cool and interesting things that you might find out that who knows might, you know, lead to a Nobel prize or, or something like that. But there's no blue star at the end of the day. There's no end to, to research. And another uh, helpful um, graphic that I find to explain why we might feel stupid in, in research, this is due to Professor Matt White, who is at the University of Alabama. And his take on research is to imagine a circle, which contains all of human knowledge at this point. So outside the circle is unknown, things we don't know. Uh, and inside the circle is all of history and art and science and math that we do know. So, after elementary school, we know a little bit. We've filled up the circle a little bit, right? We know some art and how to add numbers and write sentences and things like that. In high school, uh, likewise, we go radially outward. We all um, learn a little bit we, to be well-rounded. We do some art, some history, some math, etc. In college, we pick a major. So for instance, you can be an art major or a physics major. And so well, you do take some, if you're say a physics major, you take English classes, some history classes, some um, uh, English classes um, you, to be well-rounded more than you were in, in high school, but you do also specialize a bit. And so this little bump is for instance, uh, computer science. Um, and so at the end of college, if you pursue graduate school and you pursue a PhD, this is the path that gets you to the end of the circle and more so makes a dent in the circle. The first step is to deepen your knowledge. And so once you get to a master's degree, uh, the first part in the US of a, of a PhD, you no longer go more radially outward, but you specify on what you did in your bachelor's or, or make another bump and specify in that direction. Um, but you do this through more tests, more homeworks and, and things like that. But at this point is where you get into research. And so you start to read uh, research papers from other people where you, um, and at this point, I think I disagree with the figure a bit. I think I might make that a little bit smaller. So it's a, a bit thinner than the, the master's degree bump. Uh, but anyway, you, you read research papers on a, on a specific area of physics or, or computer science. I think we were using computer science in this example. So for instance, say you want to, um, parse languages uh, more efficiently. You read research papers, which were done by current um, researchers in the field right now. You, um, after reading hundreds, potentially thousands of, of research papers, you get an idea of where the field is right now, where everyone is struggling. Um, and by reading what's called the future directions section at the end of research papers, you think of or you're exposed to ways that other researchers think this field may go. And so you begin to have an identity of what you think your research should focus on. And so this is where uh, your, the research portion of your PhD starts. You focus on one particular area where it touches the, the edge of human knowledge 
and you focus on that for potentially years, right? Um, a PhD in the US could be anywhere from four to seven or eight years. You push the boundary for years, doing experiments, uh, asking questions, building models, um, you know, trying out new things. Uh, and eventually, through um, lots of trial and error, lots and lots of error, you make a dent. One day there's something that worked, but also I would argue that there are smaller dents than this, even though that's quite small, there are smaller dents in that that didn't work. So for instance, you say, um, okay, I wanna use this um, artificial intelligence uh, algorithm to parse uh, this Japanese language. Um, maybe it didn't work and maybe you, because science is collaborative, now other people know that that doesn't work. You might not uh, write a paper on something that didn't work, but if you have a circle of peers and professors and a research group, now they know what doesn't work. And so you have contributed to, to all of human knowledge. You, now we know that using that particular algorithm, parsing Japanese, doesn't work. Uh, and so we can try something else and that enables us to maybe get a bigger um, bump in the, in the edge of human knowledge, something that does work. And we write papers on that and other researchers learn about it and, and on we go progressing. Maybe this hump goes deeper because other researchers now are like, oh, wow, look at this. Or there are other bumps because people read your paper and say, oh, maybe this could apply to, to my field. Um, but Overall, this takes a very long time and there's lots of errors and lots of tiny bumps before a big bump like this happens. Notice I said big bump because after years of focusing on your PhD, it, it makes sense that your world has been entirely consumed by whatever problem you're working on. Um, and to explain why we might feel stupid in research is while we may feel we have an expertise on this, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, and so whenever you try to venture out of what you do know in, in research, um, after you've um, been doing years of taking tests and feeling smart, uh, it makes sense that when you get into an area that you don't know, uh, it makes sense that you fail and things are hard. Um, and so back to stupidity in science, there is uh, an, infinite, an infinite of unknown. Um, if you are at one point on that circle, there's practically an infinite edge to that. It's, it seems when you get so specialized at a point. And there is no right answer in research. You just have to persevere into the unknown areas of the world. Uh, you make guesses, you think of new experiments, or you say, okay, this, this experiment could be improved if I used uh, this algorithm instead of this algorithm. And by doing so, you not only make small dents by failing, but you, like we said, tell other people that something worked or didn't. And so you are extending things in, by being stupid, by, by just trying things and feeling stupid when, when things fail, you are contributing to knowledge and that's what research is. Um, and now let's tie this back into Dark Souls. Science is collaborative and so is Dark Souls. When you fail in science, you can um, tell other people about it. So for instance, um, if you're going to a specialized, um, something that they, they do in, in physics anyway, um, that is kind of like um, going back to school for, for PhD and, and um, postdoctoral post researchers are called summer schools, where you go and learn about a very specific topic um, it is a lecture, um, but it is very specific and uh, very few people um, know what it's about. And so a good lecturer at one of those summer schools will make note uh, of things. And this, this applies to a lot of things, right? If you think back to um, a particular math subject that you found really difficult, if that lecturer or um, teacher or professor made note of the things that tripped up the students from last year, and tell, they tell you about it, that is providing you a way to avoid things, right? So that's using other people's tiny bumps of things that didn't work 
and allowing you to avoid those tiny bumps and make your own potentially big bumps or other tiny bumps. Um, and so that's a way that scientific research and even schoolwork and education is collaborative. And the same thing occurs in Dark Souls, where this is a player reading a message that's been written on the ground by another player who says, okay, um, I struggled with these two enemies right here. Um, so, you know what, I'm going to leave a message for another player, which says, try luring it out. So try to separate the enemies and take on one at a time instead of both. Likewise, um, you fail together in, in Dark Souls and in research. So we just saw a clip of um, a ghost of another player. So the player is running across this bridge and a ghost of another player, which is the experience of another player, was that it ran off that bridge and fell off. Here's another one uh, showing us what not to do. So here's another example of the small bumps where people learn what not to do and they can make bigger bumps like traversing the bridge uh, without falling into holes. Um, and so in scientific research, this is a little bit harder to get um, because when you read a scientific article, you may not, uh, the entire focus of an article at least, may not be, we did this, we did this, and nothing happened, nothing worked. Um, journals like to publish positive results. Um, in my opinion, a good uh, journal uh, article would mention at least the things that didn't work. But in, in other cases, you will learn about these things by working with others. So if you have a, a research group, a good advisor will tell you um, what they're working on, what the other people, what the other people in the group are working on, and most of that will fail. Um, every, everyone in the group will be trying different things, maybe you'll be working on it together, and you'll fail at something. Um, and so that's the way to, um, when, when, you, when you approach a, an advisor or a professor in, and you look at their research and you read their past research papers, it seems like they're, they're geniuses, right? It seems like they're never failing, they're just publishing and publishing and it's all positive results. Um, another aspect to um, stupidity in science is to realize that there really don't exist that many geniuses out there. Um, science is much more like this uh, line, these lines of posters that uh, at this SBS meeting that symbolize small advancements or even things that didn't work, right? You can make a poster about something that didn't work. Um, and it's, it's really not like Einstein and Newton anymore. There, there are very few instances of someone uh, completely revolutionizing how we think about gravity. Um, there are uh, research teams and entire institutes who, where there are 20 people each and they all go to conferences with hundreds of each other and they collaborate and they read each other's papers and they all make tiny dents that one day hopefully can make bigger dents. Um, and I think this is something important to realize that by putting yourself out there, uh, getting into a research group, um, getting a good relationship with an advisor who is not afraid to tell you uh, they failed, um, but also reaching out, being proactive and reaching out to people you think are geniuses to ask about things because especially when you're a younger researcher, those people will have no problem at all telling you um, that they fail. They fail all the time and it's nothing to be ashamed of. And so that's something that I like to remind myself of that all the other people in research that you think, um, oh, are, are, they're, they're better at this, I'm not. And that's, that's something called imposter syndrome, where you believe that everyone else is, is doing things correctly. Um, you somehow got into this college or, or grad school or program or high school even, uh, and you don't deserve it. It was, it was luck or something. Um, and I really want to urge you to um, put, push that aside um, because most people, there, there are 1% of the people in the world who are geniuses. Uh, most people are not. Uh, and science is all about um, being collaborative with other people because most people will fail. Um, but together, uh, lots of failing tells us, uh, it, it eliminates possibilities of, of doing something incorrectly. And so th uh, the more that you, uh, as a person, as a researcher, say, I don't know, or um, 
Could you explain that to me one more time? I don't exactly follow. It will enable that attitude in others because they will likewise, regardless of how you think of them, maybe you think of everyone else in your research group as geniuses who belong uh, and you don't, they will feel the same way. And you going out of your way to say, I don't know, or can you explain that again, um, does not uh, put you out, uh, expose you as, as some imposter who doesn't belong in, in the group. It makes you a better researcher because you're able to say that I don't know something and you're able to know that failing is an integral part of research. And so I just want to leave you some more on this imposter syndrome. Um, it is something that is very common uh, in scientists, in, in academics in any sense. Um, a particular podcast I really like um, that did some great episodes on this is called Self Care with Dr. Sarah. Uh, they're two female astrophysicists, I believe, at Harvard or, or Oxford, if I am not mistaken. Uh, and they had a great uh, series of episodes. It's actually three three episodes that they had on this on this topic. And also, there is a guest post that I wrote on my friend's blog where she met five friends at one of those conferences that I was talking about, where they uh, hundreds of people in a particular area come to learn about things uh, that other people in the field are doing. I wrote a guest post on uh, kind of the evil uh, cousin of, of imposter syndrome, um, which is called self-selection, which is the idea that you um, hear about a particular scholarship or you look at um, you know, Swarthmore or UPenn and say, oh, there's no way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in there. Um, and so you don't even apply. Um, and I just want to urge you to, um, to apply because you deserve it and you are good enough. Um, and I just want to leave you with the idea that science is failing. Doing research is all about failing. Um, and so don't be afraid. Go do science and fail and don't be afraid to. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I want to invite any students to put any questions they might have in the chat right now. Um, I have two questions I can ask. Um, so I know there's a lot of research projects that can take so long to complete and the idea of failing after all that time might be hard for someone to grasp. So are there any like skills or mantras you use or recommend using to reframe a certain failure um, in a positive light? Absolutely. Um, and, and relating to, to Dark Souls is the, the idea that even if you failed, you, um, by, by the very nature of research in Dark Souls, there is no map. There's no, um, there's no list of objectives that you need to complete to get to your project. And so when you did this long, potentially year project um, and you failed at it, you made your own route. So in some sense, the infinite maze is a bit misleading because it's kind of uh, this nebulous uh, gas cloud or, or something, and you're making your own route. And so it, you're discovering your own route. And so when you fail, you absolutely can backtrack because you know exactly where you went. You know the steps you took because by the nature of research, you are doing something that someone else has never done before. And so as you progress, even if you reach a dead end, you, as you progress, you, you are learning things as you go. And whether you realize that or not, there are things that you're learning in order to push these boundaries. And so all those things that you learned could potentially sprout off in, in new paths in, into research. So you backtrack maybe a step or two steps and say, okay, this was up, up to here. I, I know everything was good. Um, so let's branch out a bit and see uh, what's going on. And so backtracking is definitely um, a helpful uh, mantra that I've, I've listened to as I reach dead ends, just back up a bit, see, like orient yourself. And it's, it's quite remarkable how easy it is to orient yourself when you failed, because by the nature of research, you're making your own path. Awesome, thanks. Um, I just have one more question. Um, do you have any advice for students who might be interested in pursuing grad school or a PhD? Absolutely. Um, I think getting undergraduate research experience is one of the best parts of, of college. Um, I think 
uh, and I will point to, um, I think my screen is still sharing. Um, I actually have uh, an article on my, on my website about how to get undergraduate uh, research experience, but I think undergraduate research experience is one of the best things of college because it enables you to investigate um, whether or not you think uh, research is something that you would be interested in. And honestly, most importantly, uh, the most uh, crucial part of undergraduate research is to experience that feeling of stupidity. It's to experience um, something completely different because I and, and almost all other um, young researchers uh, for their whole life beforehand were um, happy with science. They were, they thought they were good at science because they answered homework questions correctly or they answered test questions correctly. And so getting just a, a bit of experience in, into feeling stupid when you first encounter research is, I think, should be, I mean, it, everyone doesn't need to do research, but it's a very valuable thing. Um, and so any um, research opportunities that your college fosters, uh, I really think you should um, take advantage of them to get an idea of if you would like to do a PhD. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Those are all the questions I had. If awesome. there are any last minute questions, feel free to interrupt me, but I'm going to start to wrap up. So just a reminder to the students that this was recorded and I'll post it to Canvas later. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you all for tuning in. And we just wanna thank you again, Jason, for taking the time to present to us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to end the recording right now and I hope you guys have a great day. See you everyone. Thank you.